Hello, and welcome to the Scariest Things Podcast, episode number 12. We're your gateway to horror films, where we talk the trends and tropes of the genre. And this week, we are one week away from the Oscars. Yes, Eric is wearing a gold lame dress right now. (laughs) In celebration of the Oscars. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Because there's nothing wrong with that. It's a Versace original. Uh, and uh, this is it's we're in a unique year because we've got uh, one of our own is going to be uh, That's right. nominated for uh, unusually for best picture, best director, best actor. Yes. And, uh, and should be best, best supporting actor. Best supporting actor. Well, Little Relic should have gotten nominated. We, we covered that a couple weeks ago, um, you know. But yeah. Get Out is no- Get Out is nominated, so uh, crossing good, our fingers that, good that, movie. that we'll 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 get a, a horror movie across the threshold. It's it's exciting times. I think. I think. Uh, I think it bodes well for future horror nominees. I think we're in this golden era of of films. People are taking it seriously, and I think the serious our tour is getting some eyeballs. Yeah. So, what's your, what is your what is your first Oscar memory? Did you did you grow up? Were you were yeah. you that family that huddled around the well, TV well, set? Take a guess and watched. Point A to point B. I'm going to say yes, but what was your first memory? 1970, 78. Yeah. Star Wars. The year yeah, Woody I, Allen screwed Star- everything <laughs> up. <laughs> Andy Hall, what the fuck is that? that <laughs> and was, he continues that to screw stuff up. <laughs> Star Wars, man. Come on. Um, that was that was a year that I remember. And, I, and, and Star Wars was racking up the wins and... Uh, I was like, okay, this is it. It's best happening. picture, best picture. It's like, here it goes. Annie Hall. <laughs> God damn it. So that was my, what was, what was your first memory? Uh, you know, I think it was probably around that era. Um, I do remember, this isn't exactly an Academy Award uh, memory, but I do remember watching uh, Siskel and Ebert at the movies doing their top 10 rundown of films of the 70s and I was appalled that both uh, A Bridge Too Far which is you know the greatest war <laughs> epic ever and Star Wars did not make their top, their top didn't 10 Star Wars didn't make their top, top 10 list did oh, not my Lord. did not cry in shame no I you know we watched at my mom my mom is a big film buff uh, shout out to her she's down the street what up mom uh, she you know we used to watch it every year you know uh, pop up some popcorn, get around the TV, see see what was what. I had no idea mm-hmm. what these films were. I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea what the conversation was, or The Godfather, or The Deer Hunter, mm-hmm. or Apocalypse Now. No idea. Mm-hmm. But we sat and watched it and consumed it, and it was always fun. And mm-hmm. you always got to root, you root for or against somebody based on the most polemic identifiers possible, which is like nothing, right? You just, you just rooted for somebody, and that was what you did. You rooted to be right. You rooted to be right. Yeah. And unfortunately, in 1978, Star Wars got the shaft. Star Wars got the shaft. Um, the and Academy if, was not right. So if you haven't gotten a chance to check it out, uh, we have posted... Uh, the scariest- Eric posted. Let's be perfectly honest. I didn't do Jack Squat. And you should check this out because it is a healthy and robust dissection of horror and the Oscars. It is the epic post it is so the far post of all the post. scariest things. What there's right. actually it was so big that I had to break it into two parts. So yep. so part one of my list is every nomination for every horror movie Ever. Ever. For the Oscars. Ever. And uh, what the, we found out, not surprisingly, that horror does very well in best makeup and best visual effects <clears throat> and does very poorly in most of the other categories. But you know who doesn't have a, an Oscar? Tom Savini. Boo. Boo. <laughs> it's Come on, time. Oscars. He's still alive. Lifetime Achievement Award. That's right. Because <laughs> he is the all-time mm. makeup master. The now, best of the best. So I think one thing that you have to remember is that yeah. the best makeup category wasn't... Um, when when was did that come 1983. Around? Wow. And uh, okay. it went to a horror movie. That's. Uh, it went to American Werewolf in London. Rick Baker. Yes. Yeah. Which, if you have not seen it, is the most amazing transformation. It is cool still it's to like, this day. Yeah. It beats the pants off of any CG effect. Oh, it's, absolutely. It, it is the the bone crunching. You just you watch the man 
turn into a wolf. It is. Mm-hmm. It's a stunner. It's good stuff. And 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 his buddy, who's pretty much ripped in half, that that was also great. Yes. But so so tonight we're not covering the Oscars no. per se. But you can. We're, sh- we're in the neighborhood. We're 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 talk, We're dancing around it. But I I think the other thing to check out. So that there's the the first half of of the of the oh, list yeah, was yeah, every yeah. was every winner. Right. And then the second one is. The snubs, because right. that's one of the favorite Oscar pastimes, and I think what, snubs. take your pick whether it's if you're a comedy fan or if you're a horror fan, you often are disappointed when it's time to name the best picture of the year and all the other sundry. Uh, what do you think, films? based on your research, since you did the research, mm-hmm. what do you think has been the biggest Oscar snub? So now I'm not talking about like, mm-hmm. oh, this film was nominated but mm-hmm. didn't win, but that the Oscar didn't even give it a sniff. I think well, there, there's a couple of weird ones. Okay. Uh, the Shining got no love. It got nothing. Which is crazy. Which, which you know, Jack Nicholson. Stephen, Stephen King had something to do with that. Yeah, <laughs> m- maybe. I, I don't know if... Well, he was yeah, like, I don't... Uh, that yeah, film yeah, is like, junk and I don't want to see it get an Oscar. But, you know, between Kubrick's direction, between Nicholson's acting, between Shelley Duvall's all time... I think... I, I actually think that the Shelley Duvall's portrayal of Wendy mm-hmm. is one of the big all-time snubs as a best supporting actress. She was And Scatman Crothers greatest greatest role <laughs> since his voiceover work in Hong Kong Fooey. Hong Kong Fooey and or <laughs> Scooby Doo and the Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So what was what was the, you, there was a second one though? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's startling that Mia Farrow did not get a nomination for Rosemary's Baby. Oh, yeah. And Ruth Gordon got Best Supporting Actress. Right. Polanski also got nominated for Best Director. So it wasn't like the, uh, the Oscars weren't ready for Rosemary's Baby. They just right. weren't ready for Mia Farrow for whatever reason. She carries the weight of that movie. Right. Emotional, the emotional heft and her... Um, her acting was was superb, and I thought she she could have gotten a nom. I think uh, I think Robert Shaw for Jaws could have been sure. nominated and should have won for right. Quint right. in Jaws. I think he was crazy good in that. Oh yeah, and you know it's like the saltiest of the salty dogs. Oh yeah, singing you know sea shanties. And, well, any any one of those guys could have got yeah could have gotten out Dreyfus or yeah. uh, Roy Scheider. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, that, in, interestingly though, Mia Farrow uh, did the opposite. She had the opposite effect on the Omen remake, where she just dragged that thing down to. <laughs> <laughs> that was a whoops. <laughs> Mia Farrell, if you're listening, that was not a good choice, and you didn't. You've kind of found that one in swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. But tonight we're covering not the Oscars, not the snubs, not the coulda, shoulda, wouldas, but the directors. The directors, the best horror directors of all time, in our humble opinion. So, Mike, how, what was your attitude behind how how you were picking your directors? Um, uh, some of it was just you know like. Some of it was obviously film, you know, uh, directors I really liked, directors I identified with. It was directors that have really brought something new, mm-hmm. not necessarily taken like, you know, James Wan. Like maybe in ten years, I would get, I would throw mm-hmm. James Wan in the mix because like right now he's doing some really interesting stuff, but mm-hmm. I don't think he's quite there yet because he hasn't done anything like super duper innovative. He's done a lot of really solid, solid work, Mm -hmm. but he hasn't really kind of like pushed it into an area where we've never seen it before. So kind of uh, part of part of my thing was both the icons and the innovators. How's Mm -hmm. that for alliteration? Sure. Uh, The icons and the innovators. Double eyes. Double eyes. Icons, innovators. Ick. <laughs> uh, I, I went similar. I, you know, I wasn't going necessarily for the um, the most brilliant directors. I, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't. I didn't go for Kubrick. I didn't go nope. for because I mean he yeah, didn't really. He, he made a horror film. Right. right. I mean, there was there was some. I, you know what? You know what the funny thing about Kubrick is if you go back and look at like Eyes Wide Shut. Like, had they switched a couple scenes around, that could have been a horror film mm-hmm. very easily because mm-hmm. it is really dark. And right. there's some very, 
very, very disturbing, disturbing imagery. Or Clockwork and, Orange could be. I mean, some, some people say it, yeah. it's a dystopian story. It's sure. more sci-fi than <laughs> horror, but they could have. He could have gone down that route. I, the little of the ultra violence could have been a little bit more ultra violent, and it could oh, have yeah. gone. It could have gone horror. For sure, Barry but, London, uh, not so much. But I, I think that <laughs> w- what I was targeting was directors who made their marks as horror directors primarily. Uh, right. So, so yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And for and sure. in some cases, it's not necessarily for. I have one director who it's not the quality of the films, but it's the influence of what he did to the industry. Sure. And you know, and I think there's a couple of them that we could toss out there. There's several yeah. of them that. Right. And I bet you your your list is going to be riddled with guys who were. Or in most case, guys. And yeah. you might you might have there's there's a, there's a few women out there who are there making are, marks, but there are uh, not there yet. Yeah, not I think there are a couple of them um, uh, under the belt. The Babadook. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very good director. Uh, no, I, I you know it was interesting because when I started going down the list, it's like there you know ho- horror direct. There are so many horror directors and iconic so, horror directors. Yeah, and they're so evocative too. Like you know people have. Very, very definite opinions about them, mm-hmm. their body of work, mm-hmm. what they brought to the industry. And, I mean, I did try to keep to those people, much. I think much like you, who really stuck with the horror genre as opposed to... Because there's a lot of these directors who will kind of like pop in and out just depending on probably mm-hmm. a variety of things. I'm not going to cast any aspersions, mm-hmm. but it's probably the paycheck. It's probably, you know, how much time they had on their hands. It's probably who's throwing what at them. But for those people that really tried to stick to the, um, that really tried to stick to the genre, um, those are the ones that I, that I was interested in. So why don't you lead us off? All right. So I'm going to start, uh, with, um, the one, the only, some call the Italian Italian. Alfred, uh, Alfred Hitt, no, not quite, not quite. The Italian Hitchcock, who is responsible for, he gave us The Cat of Nine Tails, Door into Darkness, Deep Red, Suspiria, Inferno, Phenomena, Opera, Two Evil Eyes, The Mother of Tears. He was also the writer and producer on Demons and Demons 2, and he was producer and did a lot of the writing on The Dawn of the Dead. Of course, I'm talking about Dario Argento. Um, I mean, this is a guy, uh, this is a guy who really, yeah, he, he stuck, he never really vacillated from the horror genre. I mean, this guy stuck with it. He, you know, right out the gate, I can't remember what his first film was. I think it was Four, Four Flies on Gray Velvet. Um, I think that was his first one. And, you know, from there on, he only got weirder and creepier and, and stabbier um (laughs) you know his the thing that's amazing is that his his films are both like it's sort of the it's kind of that like that japanese kind of uh, push pull i can't remember the exact term in japanese culture but it's kind of like it's it's horrific but it's this trans uh, transcendent kind of visual beauty sort of all at once is what he gives you i i Uh, I, I think in my uh, Oscar snubs, mm-hmm. um, I am a firm believer that uh, Dario Argento and his production deserved a Best Art Direction nomination. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, for and, sure. And, and, and I, I think that it was kind of a tough year. I think Star Wars Star Wars was up in 78. Right. But I think that, there, that it, was, it was a uh, unique and powerful visual imagery. I think that he tapped in... He's, he had this notion of the Art Nouveau mm-hmm. and those primary colors and those patterns that just yep. come at you, and then it's juxtaposed with this, the 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 violence and the and and how it's one of those things. Was how can be something so pretty be so scary? You know, right, kind of a thing. Right. I, I think he that was I, I think of of all horror movies ever done. Yeah, Suspiria has the best art direction. I mean, there's been some good Probably ones. Pretty this close. One, this was pretty a close. this was a, a spectacular. Yeah, showcase of of Italian horror. Yep, but all of his all of his films, I think, bring something again. Kind of going to the 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 innovator side of the the coin. I think all of his films bring something different that not a lot of directors ever really tapped into. Whether it's 
the soundtrack, which he paid really close attention to, Goblin, uh, the Goblin, uh, and 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 others, uh, whether it's um, the actors that he used, and he used a whole different variety of actors. I mean, Donald Pleasance was in one of his films, Carl Malden, um, you know, lots of different people. Uh, Carl Malden, of course, was in Deep Red. No, not Deep Red. Uh, Catman Tales. Um, he. Yeah, he brought he brought really interesting stuff to the table, and and you know he's still I think he's seventy I want to say seventy four years old. He is still kicking around. There what is a movie he did. Do you, do you, I think it was uh, Drac Dracula. Uh, God, what was it called? It was Dracula Dario Argento's Dracula or something. <laughs> Widely panned, didn't right. do well. Uh, I think he was trying to go back to kind of the late 60s, kind of early 70s hammer, sexy vampire sort Mm -hmm. of thing. And it was a sort of a dreaded failure. But he's still kicking around and and trying new stuff. Um, Obviously, his his daughter is is still very, very active in film. And and, and, uh, she, in her own right, has done a lot of interesting stuff. Do we know what, what she's done? She was in Land of the Dead. She's been in a couple of his films. I think she was in Opera. Might have been her first film with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so she's she's done stuff as well. So yeah, uh, Dario Argento yeah, uh, can't go wrong. Really, I mean, some of his films are a little a little far out there, um, but um, solid, solid director. So that is my number four on our fearsome foursome. Eric, what is your number? Four on the fierce force. Okay, my my number four is sort of the godfather of Grindhouse and Schlock. Ooh. Um, he is uh, he's got fifty six movie credits under his belt. Fifty six. And if I'm saying fifty six zombie, no. no, God help us <laughs> if he's got fifty six <laughs> terrible movies. Seems to like watch. it. Now this guy does his fair share of terrible movies, mm-hmm. and uh, but. He has been. He has produced and directed so many films and inspired a generation of directors. Uh, Roger Corman. Oh boy, yeah. Uh, so starting out with some of the dumbest, schlockiest, fun monster movies in the 1950s. Right. Uh, it conquered the world. Yeah. Attack of the Crab Monsters. The Wasp Women. Uh, a bucket of Blood. I mean, there were yes, just there were all of those. These they just they're. Pure matinee, dumb, fun, yep. cheap movies. He mastered. He he ushered in the uh, the efficiency of trying to get out two or three movies during the summertime that kids could go see and and introduce horror to 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 kids with these very dumb rubbery monsters. You right. know, I think I I recently posted the. Uh, the movie poster to it conquered the world, and the thing—it's a—it's an ice cream cone with teeth. I mean, it is—it's—it's it's fantastic. And and if not for Roger Corman, uh, Mystery Science Three Thousand wouldn't wouldn't exist. Right? Oh, absolutely. But he he did he he had a a real turn though. I mean, yeah. he went from dumb schlocky stuff to in nineteen sixties he teamed up with Vincent Price. Right. Right. And he had he had a, a string of eight. Consecutive Edgar Allan Poe movies, right? Where he did uh, the Mask of the Red Death, he did yep. the Pit and the Pendulum, the, yep. Fall of the House of Usher, yep. uh, the Terror. Yep. He did a lot of. It was he was he was watching across the pond and seeing what Hammer was doing, right? And realized I'm going to bring Scary back to Hollywood after mm. sort of dumbing down Scary in the 1950s. Right. I mean that was Abbott and Costello era, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 1960s, you come back and. And uh, there was a title shift and a willingness for um, for audiences to get get a little bit m- more adult. Yeah. And I think the, that Vincent Price helped carry him there, and that sort of rolled through. And the, by the time he hit the nineteen seventies, his his work he went into production right. more than anything else, and it was it's kind of an Irwin Allen character where he's yeah. funding a lot of sort of disaster movies and he did and, Piranha. And Piranha, yeah, Piranha. And I think he, he did. did Piranha. So he's and Death Race, Death Race five thousand and and two thousand, two thousand, right? With the with David two thousand, right? I, that was three thousand too many Death yeah, Races. <laughs> <laughs> Death Race so, two thousand. You know, and he's the, the the fact that he's still kicking around and funding. He is kicking around, and there's a great documentary about Roger Corman that came out a couple years ago. 
Uh, yeah, he's still involved. He's still reading scripts. He's still funding stuff. He's still helping out young directors. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he did have a, 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 a hand in the new the new Death Race mm-hmm. 2000 film, which was really terrible. Yeah. Uh, but I'm pretty sure he did have a hand in that. Yeah. The documentary is really interesting because it kind of gets into sort of who he is and his psyche and how he does stuff and why he does it. And, and yeah, you just the enormity of his... His volume of work is unparalleled. Listen up, Hollywood. Yeah. You will never see another director like this ever, probably. Director producer, he is yep. he is huge. I think the he he's almost Kevin Feige like in, mm-hmm. in in the way that he his his ability to orchestrate sort of multiple productions and to get yeah. and and um, to create. I mean that's. And essentially, that his his Poe series was at the time it was it was the Poe extended universe, right? Right. right. And uh, you know, going back to the old musty uh, tomes that of of the of the early nineteen hundred eighteen hundreds, right? It's like, but this is, he he minded to some great stuff. He also did a little bit of Lovecraft. Yeah. So yeah, he, he Boy, was that, like, you know, wouldn't that be interesting to have somebody? I mean, I know Hollywood is scratching the bottom of the barrel looking for ideas to go back and and give some of the Edgar Allan Poe stuff the treatment. That would be interesting. Yeah, I bet you could do some uh, uh, really cool stuff. You, got, you have to do a serious take. You yeah. got to keep Johnny Depp and and uh, yes, uh, Helen Bonham Carter uh, off. Oh, stay the away. <laughs> stay away. So that's my number four. Who you got? All number right. three. Number three, um, not necessarily an innovator, but somebody who has stuck with the craft. Uh, born in October of 1980 is the American film director, producer, screenwriter, editor, cinematographer, and occasional actor. I just read that from Wikipedia. Uh, Ty West. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, avoided, <laughs> I, I, I avoided putting Ty West on my list because I figured that you would so that I wasn't going to duplicate it. He, yeah, we, I mean, we've talked about Ty West in a couple different contexts. We talked about him in, like, Scariest Movies, House of the Devil. We talked about him in the context of Best Ghost Movie, The Innkeepers. I can't remember if that was our first crossover or that was definitely a crossover. Um, he also has done some really uh, some other interesting stuff. Oh, this he is did. Jim Jones one. Is that the Covenant? Uh, the the Sacrament. The Sacrament. That okay. was uh, 2013. Oh, that's a good one. That's a Flip. that's a powerful. You, you, oh yeah. That I, that that may be. You know, I forgot. I had forgotten about that one the last time we were talking about our top top films. Mm-hmm. Check out the Sacrament. The, the yeah the the uh, it's, he it's a super interesting idea, super interesting device. Uh, Vice magazine uh, goes down to South America to cover a Jim Jones uh, cult of Guyana type cult and things go, of course go totally haywire. He also did a film I liked um, called the the Roost uh, which was kind of a kind of a vampire film in 2005 and then he also did a film early on early early um, just right after the roost called the trigger man which isn't it's not exactly um, it's not exactly a horror film per se although if you put things like southern comfort and mm-hmm. and and uh, those kinds of uh, stuck in the woods uh, having to face face down a madman that you you know who a faceless madman who you may not know who, who they are or where they are um <laughs> Uh, Trigger Man was was kind of like that, uh, and the interesting thing about that, in terms of his innovation, it was like a film. I think he did. I don't know if he was in college or just out of college, but it was basically his. It was a. It was an old abandoned uh, warehouse, not too far from his house um, in um, Rhode Island, I believe. <laughs> anyway, uh, East Coast. We'll say East Coast. We'll just narrow it down to that. But, um, you know, the film essentially was, you know, they would go and shoot it on the weekends. It was somewhat of a guerrilla production, but it was basically about some folks out out and about in the woods who uh, are targeted by somebody who you ultimately never see. And that's kind of like very emblematic of the way Ty West does stuff is that he doesn't he doesn't show he doesn't show his cards. He doesn't produce for you the obvious scares. He makes you earn it. He makes you feel it before anything happens. And I think one of the reasons why Mike likes Ty West so much is he's he's a throwback to the 70s. Yeah, oh, yeah. It is a slow burn yep. build. 
He always gives you a good finish. Mm-hmm. Um, but you they have don't, to. They don't te- you got to be patient it with him. Got uh, He teases it out. Um, he did. He did do some strength. There was a. You know, he hit a patch where he was. You know, they brought him in to to work on Cabin Fever Two, Spring Fever, uh, <laughs> and he apparently had all sorts of problems with with uh, editing and re re editing and re re writing and. He tried to get his name removed um, from the film, but he was not able to do so, and so he's often credited for that. He was also set to direct The Haunting in Georgia, the sequel to The Haunting in Connecticut, but again, that, that project kind of fell by the wayside. I, I've been seeing, uh, uh, if I'm going on Netflix, yeah. there's a whole series of A Haunting in. Yeah. And I Too suspect, many hauntings in. I that. suspect that it's just <laughs> total hack. Rip stuff. off, yeah, yeah. and I, I haven't been tempted to do it, but his one, was, his the one he was looking at was haunting in Georgia. Haunting in Georgia, yeah. But then he was also involved with uh, VHS. Uh, he did, he directed the sec- the segment called Second Honeymoon, which was pretty cool, uh, pretty cool little uh, short in the context of the first VHS film, not VHS two. So yeah, Ty West is a great director. You pretty much can't go wrong with any of his films. He turns in solid work. Yeah, and and he's a young fella too. He's yeah, he's got, born in nineteen eighty. Yeah, so he's got a lot of not a lot of a lot of movie left yet. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what do you got for your number three on your fearsome foursome list? My my number three is uh, Sam Raimi. Oh, I was close. Yeah, so close. The, the, the only thing that but Sam, he vacillated from horror too yeah, much. Yeah, I, I think you know that that his his full list. He doesn't hasn't done a whole lot of films. Um, no. But uh, his Evil Dead, mm. Evil Dead Two, Army of Darkness, his return yeah. to the Evil Dead with Ash vs. Evil Dead, which launches today on Stars. <laughs> and if you want, if you want uh, something good and bloody and stupid fun, watch Ash vs. Evil Dead. It mm-hmm. is. It will reward you with rampant, gory silliness. Oh yeah. Uh, but I think that he squeezed in between all of those. He also did Drag Me to Hell. And, and Dragon so, to Hell is good. It's it's uh, a lot of fun. Again, it's that's a PG thirteen horror movie. It's a great gateway horror film and somewhat Ty West esque in that it ends with a wonderful punchline that you kind of don't see coming necessarily. It, 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 it's, a, it's, it's a fun wink at the end. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, but the the premise of that film because you I'm I'm assuming that most people listening to this podcast are familiar with the setup for uh, the Evil Dead. Uh, with Ash and, and the, the amazing Bruce Campbell having to, to uh, fight off scourges of demons. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Drag Me to Hell is a, is a, has this fantastic premise of a young woman who is a claim settler for an insurance company. Right. And she's trying to prove her mettle to move up through the ranks by getting tough with an old lady about a claim settlement. <laughs> Unfortunately, that old lady is a gypsy. Gypsy witch, and she Gypsy gets witch. and she curses uh, our protagonist, and it is it not uh, go well. we yeah, it we saw sense. that film at the Lloyd Center. Yeah, I'm positive. Yeah, and and there's what there's lots Lloyd of Center? puking of lots of things. That's one thing that uh, Sam Raimi is awfully fond of is vomiting. He's got he's vomit he's, is his jam. Vomit and just geysers of blood and and. Things streaming out, and he. It, I think that for for me, Sam Raimi is fun. Yeah. Sam Raimi is a. He has a. He has an He's absolute not an joy. Artur per se. No, but he does. But there are some things that he does. Like if I, it, it's like a Sam Raimi shot. Yeah. I think of uh, the eyeball popping out of the right. uh, of the the demon yeah. and then shooting through, and you got the eyeball cam, <laughs> right. and it lands in, the, in 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 the woman's mouth, and she swallows it and freaks out and runs out and gets. Get, gets yeah. gets killed off by uh, I think she, does she get killed off by trees? I know that there's several times that trees come in and, and do horrible things to people. A lot of trees. Um, a lot so, of trees with the video nasty. Yeah. The, what is your What is your favorite Sam Raimi film? Evil Dead Two. Yeah. I, it's just it is madcap. It is one not of, Dark Man. I, you know I like I like <laughs> Dark Man. I, I, you know I think I've got a soft spot for Dark yeah, Man. Dark Man's a good film. But they they also do the the Raimi shot. There is someone shoots a a, uh, a bolt. Like a bolt mm. gun, and you see the point of view from the bolt. It's just right. it's the it's the reenactment of the eyeball scene from Evil Dead Two. Right. 
his Spider-Man movies also do this kind of stuff. Right, right, it's right. It's the Sam Raimi move. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like a triple Lutz, right? Yeah, you, yeah. They, ought, they, ought to, they ought to name it the Raimi. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, Sam Raimi's solid. And uh, you're right, he has he has straight away, but the fact that he's producing Ash vs. Evil Dead, uh, I don't think That's that he's... Cool. he's yeah, I, I do hope that he it. returns... Returns back to the genre in a big way. I think he he could he, he easily could yes and easily could he lo- He's got like the chops like uh, I think did he, he have any involvement in the remake of Evil Dead? Do you no. know? No, I don't think so. Okay, um, but he this is like I think in some ways it's like Peter Jackson. Sure, it's another one who I considered in this role. Yeah. Because he, but he, he get back to it. He strayed away from horror, but man, when he did horror, he had a lot of fun doing it. Get back to it. Come yeah. on, that's your love your foundation. Exactly. So, who's your two? My number two is David Cronenberg. Go! Oh. Do we have a crossover? No! Nope. Oh, no. That's my number two. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, we're, we're, we're going to talk David Cronenberg here for the next couple minutes. I mean, we have talked a lot about David Cronenberg. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, his his shtick is body horror. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's body transformation. Yeah. It's the fear of body transformation. It's, it's disease. It's the it's the it's the psychological kind of intermingled with the physical, right? Yeah. It's, it's like you're something's going on with your body, and your brain is saying, "What in the hell is going on with my body? Or, How do I fix this?" Or machine melding with flesh, right? Like yeah. Videodrome in, in the case or of the fly existence yeah. existence. Uh, yeah, he did. Yeah, so he did Rabbit in 1977. That was the first big one, and that's a great film with uh, former porn star Marilyn Chambers. Yes, as the as the vampiric uh, uh, zombie, zombie yes. monster thingy. Yeah. yeah, which is probably what? What do you think? Uh, she's Marilyn Chambers is probably in her 80s now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put that visual together. Yeah, that was gross. Uh, he did. He did. He did the brood. He did scanners, video drum, dead zone, fly, dead, dead ringers. Which I remember seeing dead ringers in college, and I don't remember what the context. Jeremy was. Irons, right? Jeremy Irons and lots of weird gynecological stuff. And I remember thinking, this is. This might be this might be the bridge too far. Yeah. Like all this very peculiar. Cronenberg's got weird fetishes, man. He yes. is a, he, I bet you in person he is one weird dude. Yep. But he, you know, in the '90s he did kind of start to stray from all that uh, as he became more of an artur. He did Naked Lunch, which is sort of the ultimate artur mm-hmm. trying to tackle William Burroughs, which is the. The untackleable, right? It, uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah, so we've talked, we've talked before about trying to tackle Lovecraft Burroughs. <laughs> Go, uh, although you know what? Give it up. So uh, I, I would, I, I just sort of assi- an aside. Yes. Um, so on A Friday, William Burroughs aside, what? <laughs> uh, I saw Annihilation. Mm. We talked about Annihilation mm-hmm. before. Burroughs the, yeah, the, the uh, at least Alex Garland. Oh yeah. Put him on a, on a William Burroughs thing because that that is one crazy acid trip of a movie. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and a similarly really hard uh, Jeff Vandermeer tough tough book to try and translate. Right. Pulled it off. Yeah. I'm still confused as hell. Right. But it and Eric did. For, I won't. I I don't. Want, I won't spoil the review. But he did compare it to the end of 2001, which I'm not buying until I see it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I think actually. It, 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 so, the, emotionally, you, the way that had that, you, that had movie. you taken a hyperbole pill that that day? No, it's, I think the, the, the if you follow me, you go go yeah. watch it because okay, what, what will, you will see I is will, that I, I want to see it. it it's a um, similar setup mm-hmm. in uh, thematically, and then in that there's a um, the mystery gets uh, unfurled, and then you have a fairly conventional second act, right? Which is probably going to be the most engaging part for most audiences. That sure. Uh, as in 2001, it's the part that you can grasp, right? Because it's uh, there's there's a uh, there's a uh, a mystery that's unfolding, and then you have a clear um, uh, mission. So there's a direct line; you can see where right. it's going. It's and then the, it's pretty linear, yeah. And then the third act completely uh, throws you in the washing machine, right. and it's uh, you say, "I don't get it," but right. it was cool. 
Speaking of not getting things, going back to David Cronenberg, he did, in 1996, he did Crash, which was yeah. somewhat acclaimed. Uh, I know it won some awards. I can't remember which ones, but uh, where he fetishized... Car crashes. Car crashes, amputees, real, some really strange, deep psychological stuff. I don't know that I would put it in the horror. I, that, that, we should have, that should have been the a horror, horror, not horror. We may end up going back to a horror, or not we episode. We might do horror, not horror. And then in 2002, he did Spider, which is also a really yeah. eerie, eerie film. Uh, yeah. So David Cronenberg has got... Uh, you know, I, again, he like he did Madame Butterfly. Okay, so he didn't he didn't fully stick with the genre. Mm-hmm. But I I'm gonna like. I mean, even he did a pretty solid solid run, solid yeah. run. Yeah, I I think that uh, who who is somebody did did Wes Craven ever go away from horror? Uh, or did Toby Hooper ever not do horror? Well, t- well, no. I was thinking. I was thinking of Life Force with the, the the sexy uh, the sexy vampires, sexy space va- vampires, sexy space vampires. Oh, it's a boring movie. Uh, a- boring movie, which isn't necessarily going away from horror. Yeah, uh, probably not. Maybe no. I don't know. But but Cronenberg had, had he has the talent to drift away and come back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he has the talent, even if he's making a film that isn't a horror film, to bring some horrific elements to it. Yeah. The Fly, one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. All right, so who's your number one? My number one is the director of my all-time favorite horror movie. I got oh. John Carpenter. Oh, see, this is, a, this is a total coin flip for me, my number one. Okay. Yeah. But so, no, I, we, didn't cross, it, we didn't cross over. Okay. We um, did not cross over. I was, cl- so, I was close on this one. Because as I described in, my, in our very first episode, uh, my horror, favorite horror movie of all time is The Thing. Yeah. Uh, it's a, and this is a guy that has not... Strayed very far from no, the horror genre. No, no, I mean, uh, Assault on Precinct Thirteen. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> so you know, but Halloween, a very different movie than The Thing. Yep. Uh, Prince of Darkness. Yep. They um, live. Not a horror film. No, but it's deals but it's some, so but it's, it's all genre. It's all genre. It's yeah, all, deals right. with some dystopian kinds of qualities. Right, you know, and there's skull faced aliens. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it, but Big John Carpenter's Vampire, China. yeah, <laughs> Big Trouble in Little China, yeah. Well, it's got monsters in it again. Yeah. It, but he's not. He's not going to do My Dinner with Andre, right? He's that's not his. That's right. not his thing. He's going to stay within the zone of of giving us something sort of fantastical. And mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I think we talked about our our guilty pleasures uh, last time out, and I like suck Ghosts of Mars. Yeah. So yeah, Ghosts of Mars is good. Uh, so, anyways, I think that. Hard to dispute the impact that, that uh, John Carpenter has. I think, you know, if we go back to talking about the Oscars, at some point, somebody's got to get him in for a Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, oh, this absolutely. Because his influence on, on horror and the, the just the epic... I think in in the mirror of, of time, Halloween and The Thing are two of the most important movies of the, of the 20th century. Easily. So easily, easily. And, and you know, he has an himself. incredible, incredible musical canon as well. He yeah. has done most of the music. A lot of his stuff is being re released. Yeah. He even re re recorded a bunch of stuff with his sons, mm-hmm. uh, recorded, uh, re recorded a bunch of the mm-hmm. themes of his films with his sons in, mm-hmm. in kind of a modern twist. Yeah, yeah. Halloween epic, right? That's the, that, that is a, best the, of the best. Uh, and speaking of Halloween, He's gonna do uh, a reboot of Halloween with the uh, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis is yes. coming back, and so uh, that's going to be issued at uh, for Halloween this year. Yeah, it's gonna be fantastic. It will. All right, so my number one needs no introduction. This is a guy that did not ever really veer from the horror genre. Can I guess? Well, sure. George Romero. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's an easy one. This guy, he stuck with it. He rode this thing till it was done, uh, till he was done. Um, Night of the Living Dead, Season of the Witch, The Crazies, Martin, Dawn of the Dead, Night Rider, Creep Show, Day of the Dead, Monkey Shines, The Dark Half, Bruiser, Land of the Dead, Diary of the Dead. Uh, 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 he he really was truly, truly an icon and an innovator. And again, I mean, much much like. Much like um, a lot of these guys we're talking about, um, you know, uh, much like Roger Corman, 
there will never be, you'll never see another George Romero. I mean, even if like James Wan sticks with it, right. you know, for the next 30 years, people will probably not revere him in the, in the same he didn't, way. He as, didn't break the mold. I think there's, a, the, you can break down horror movies from before and after Night of the Living Dead. Right. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I think, oh, I think that absolutely. Is, that, 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 yes, the, that is the cosmic threshold. I, I don't and, think... And I don't want to I don't want to sound like I'm bad-mouthing James Wan because he does good movies. No, no but, but <laughs> nobody's, nobody's going to say before and after Saw. I mean, no. I love James Wan. No, I think no, James no. Wan's probably... The, 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 I think Ty West and James Wan are, are the guys who are going to carry us forward into the next, yeah. next couple of decades. Before Saw, there was no Saw. And then after Saw, there was like Saw... Too many Saws. Nine. Maybe, yeah. Uh, <laughs> although, you know, I will, I will grant you that Romero's zombie movies eroded his, his original... Oh, yeah, like the, the, for the, sure. That, that he had the, the, that... That bell curve that mm-hmm. he had. Well, actually, it was it actually launched with Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, yeah. And also, I think if it no, a if, weird, it was a very weird looking bell curve. If no Night of the Living Dead, no Blair Witch Project. Right. No Paranormal Activity. It, it, right. it said, "I can do a, a scare the shit out of you movie mm-hmm. on a super tight budget with yep. no name actors, and I am going to deliver top flight scares." And, right. And I think no Dawn of the Dead. No preppers in America. No, <laughs> no Walking Dead. No American American fixation on zombies in right. the two thousand. No, this it is a it, it was a game changer. It's as much of a game changer as Frankenstein was. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, this is a good list. I think I think we. I mean, we obviously left off some of the some of the biggies. Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, we left off uh, well, Toby Hooper, Toby Hooper, Wes Craven, Wes Craven. Uh, So let's we'll give a shout out to all these guys because because they deserve it as well. But um, I mean, if you really want to get down to, I mean, again, I you know I was trying to go off of innovators uh, and and people who kind of stuck with the genre and, and all of them the, did. Yeah, these are the guys that did that for yeah. sure. Innovators and icons. Innovators and icons. So. Let's get to our dead and undead list. Do you want to go first? What What is the film this week that people should absolutely see? Okay, this is our undead. This our is my undead, undead, my, undead pick of the week. My undead pick this week is I'm going to throw a real super curveball. This Uh-oh. is this is my knuckle Popeye. knuckle spitball. Shelley Duvall and no, Popeye. I'm picking a short film. Ooh. Ooh, interesting. Uh, and a short film that I have posted on our website. Oh, I did the same thing. Uh, so not a short film, but but something that we posted. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I, I, in researching the Oscar snubs, mm-hmm. I felt obliged to get every category in. So I did a lot of research on horror short films, and I found a gem. Yeah. I found a bunch of gems actually. Yeah. But the one that I will direct to this audience is uh, "Don't Move." Oh. Which is, it's it's a little unique with short films because one thing I found with the short films there's there's a lot of them that mimic lights out, yeah, which yeah. is fantastic little two minute thing of lights off, lights on, lights yeah. off, lights on, and then it's like and then something jumps on on you, a right. jump scare, right? right, right, right. Um, fairly easy to do with limited technology. Sure. Um, Don't move gave us a single scene, which was. Uh, a bunch of idiots summon a demon on a Ouija board, and then it becomes a uh, a game of freeze tag or you die. Demon, <laughs> demon rips you up, rips you into shreds, and this this one actually brought out the full gore effects. Uh huh. And the, these these poor people they, they start off after the first couple of people have gotten gotten lunch. You hear it in the background right, of, right, of the right. intro. And these people are trying to, it's like, do I take a chance and try and get somebody else to move to spare myself? Right. Do I try and, do I do the honorable <laughs> thing? Because, it, because the, the, the pact is there are six people who summon the demon, five people must die. Wow. And, and if you move, you're dead. What uh, what kind of an investment are we in for if we watch this short film? It's fourteen minutes, I think. Fourteen. So that's it's, it's that's a, easy. And so it that is, is easy. A, it's it's a hell of a lot of fun. That is an easy get. 
All right, my undead for the week is a film uh, whose whose VHS cassette I've been staring at now for many years, and I finally got around to watching it. The Final Terror, which I also just recently reviewed on the scariestthings.com 1T, 1T. website. Um, this <laughs> this film, like as I started to watch, I'm like, oh my god, that's that's Daryl ha- Daryl Hannah. Oh my God, that's Joe Pantoliano. Oh my God, that's Adrian Zmit. Oh my God, that's Rachel Ward. Oh my God, that's Mark <laughs> Metcalf, Niedermeyer from Animal House. What is going on? Like, all these people in one movie? Is that possible? I'd never heard of this movie before. In 1980, so this is a 1983 sort of teen horror romp in the woods. Uh, it is a fun movie. It's basically, a, it's a, it involves a male... Uh, a sort of forestry crew decides to go down. They, they're required to go down river and do some un, uh, unknown forestry work, and they decide to bring along a bevy of ladies. <laughs> Inappropri- <laughs> inappropriately. Inappropriately. And um, they, uh, interestingly, they, 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 one, of the, one, of the, one night around the campfire, one of the guys tells this story of um, a, uh, a woman who had basically been cast out to the woods. Turns out it's actually a real story. And she is this crazy woman who's running around the woods. Um, you know, nerves get frayed. Everyone turns on each other. Classic sort of uh, tale lost in the woods. Uh, kind of a fun, interesting ending that I wasn't really expecting. I mean, maybe I was and sh- or should have been, I guess. Uh, but it could be a good film. So what is your dead pick? What is the film to stay away from? D-E-A-D dead. Um, it's actually an Oscar winner. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> but it's as- it's Oscar winning for uh, costume and makeup. Uh, Bram yeah. Stoker's Dracula. Oh. I just, I cannot do stupid... Uh, and ricey vampires. I'm sorry. It just bored me to tears. Yeah. Uh, it's got Gary Oldman in it, right? I know. It, it should be... It should... I should have been entertained and I just got bored. It was just so... And and maybe... You know, I think we we may have discussed this before, but vampire movies are tough. I they mean, are it's tough. Just, um, it's, it's hard to pull off. You know, because I, I don't know... How, it's like, it's not... The movie wasn't scary at all and it was just... And it's a very literal interpretation of literature. Yeah. And, and it was... It's like, if I want Dracula, I'm going to go to... Um, my, my first stop is Horror of Dracula 1958. Yeah. My second stop is Dracula 1932 yep. with Bela Lugosi. Yep. I probably don't need any more Dracula. I right. just... Uh, the, right. the, that, um, worst, that, worst horror director, Francis Ford Coppola. Yeah, I was like... <laughs> this is, it, it, it had... It was so hyped, right? Yeah. And I remember yeah, yeah. going to see it and I was like... Well, now I I won't you know clearly it's not as bad a movie as say it conquered the world sure but I liked it conquered the world for all its dumb stupid yeah, kind yeah. of rubbery monsterness I just you know what I did like about, about Dracula, Dracula. Uh, the the well the, the the Bram Stoker's Dracula the nineteen ninety two three something yeah. like that. Uh, I love, there was the whole intro sequence when they give you the, it's kind of like a faux animated sequence uh, at the beginning of the film where they kind of give you the whole trajectory of Mm -hmm. why Vlad the Impaler was Mm -hmm. Vlad the Impaler and how, that was really well done. Mm Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it was a slog. It was a slog. It was was, was, a super duper slog. It was beautiful, but it didn't pay off anything. No. There was no, and and, you know, it's like, come on, Coppola, you expect more from Coppola. Got to give us something. Yeah. So that's, that was my disappointing. What's your... My dead pick of the week this week is, uh, which is, it's it's a shame because the first two were pretty good. The first one was great. The second one was meh, and the third one, blah. (laughs) This is, this is the 2017 uh, Rings. Uh, Oh no, did you actually see it? I just, Uh, I stayed away. So I got, 4.5 4.5 on IMDb. Uh, I got 7% on Rotten Tomatoes. There's some definite rings haters out there. And I got one out of four stars on the Ebert website. Um, it's basically the same friggin' story. Uh, and this, this woman becomes concerned when her boyfriend uh, basically decides to watch the movie. Uh, and uh, But he learns that, or she learns rather, that uh, there's a movie within the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Rings is not. Boy, that, that, it's, it's just not good. It was like even from the even from the get go, there was supposed to be this like really tense scene on the plane, um, you know, where sort of like the 
the, the paranormal stuff starts to happen mm-hmm. as they're coming down on the plane and this guy discloses, the, the boyfriend in the film discloses that, you know, he, seven days ago, he had watched the video, the video and he was on the edge of death and even that was just like so boring. It was just boring and dumb and unnecessary. Yeah, I, and they didn't bring, uh, and, and I guess to, 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 to bring this whole thing full circle, there was no innovation, right? Icons and innovators, and this the rings had no innovation at all. And, Boring. Yeah, and 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 what it, but it had the first one was as you're saying was great, mm-hmm. um, and, but it's both both the U.S. version and the Japanese version. Yeah, I, super, I, I, super, super super duper great. They just went back to the well like Blair Witch. Yep. They shouldn't have gone back to that well. They tried. They're trying to mine properties that that people still remember. Yep. But it's like, it's, uh, you know, it's like, there's too many good new films right. that are coming out from directors who are hungry with original stories rather than retreads. Right. So that's, all right. right. So good week. That will, number 12. That will number do it for number 12. All right. I, so uh, until next time, uh, we, we will talk to you. After the Oscars, where you should bring a bucket of popcorn and a bucket of blood. Yes. Yeah.